Uh, we're going to have three presentations today. Uh, the first one by uh, Sardar, the second one by Safa, and the third one by Paul. Uh, and I make it friendly right away uh, using your first name. <laughs> uh, and then uh, the rules of the game, uh, they're very basic and simple. Two rules. The first one is 15 minutes, not more, one more. And then the second one is all the questions will come at the end of the three presentations. Uh, it makes it easier because it's much more difficult if you have uh, questions in between to control the time. Um, so we have a full hour, and if we start right now with the first presentation, which is by Safdar Hamed, I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing your name, I mean, the perfect way, I'm sorry about that. Uh, so uh, Safdar is a Sydney-based artist, academic in Islamic studies and educator. He is the, the author of Reform and Modernity in Islam, uh, published in uh, 2013. And uh, the Walt Klee Award winning documentary web comic Villa Wood Notes from an Immigration Detention Center in 2015. And I had a look yesterday on it, and it looks very interesting, and I will read it in the next days. That uh, web comic was expanded and adapted into a graphic novel called Still Alive in 2021, this year, which is available through um, 12 Panels Press. He's, found, uh, he's a founding member of the community art organization Refugee Art Project and member of 11, a collective of contemporary Muslim Australian artists, curators, and writers. And with this presentation, please, the floor is yours, uh, Sabdal. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, and it's very nice to meet you all, Chris, Paul, and Safa. Um, so I'm speaking from Northwest Sydney. I'm speaking from the country which belongs to the Guringai people. It's the traditional lands of the Guringai people. Um, and so I'd like to begin by acknowledging their custodianship of the land um, and acknowledging their elders, past and present, and acknowledging as well that sovereignty was never ceded. So um, <clears throat> my background is in Islamic studies, which I studied in the 2000s. I finished my PhD around 2010, and it was a sort of intellectual history of modern Islamic reformist ideologies. And I guess my background was really in post-colonial um, studies, the literary side of things. And I was quite influenced by the subaltern school um, in India, subaltern studies, I should say, which also looked at... Uh, colonial texts and also the resistance to those texts and, you know, resistance and anti-colonial movements. So I've always been interested in, um, in that area, I guess. And um, <clears throat> more recently, I've been doing a lot of community work with asylum seekers and refugees in Australia. When I was doing my PhD, I came across a lot of Islamophobic material um, I was at university as an undergraduate, actually, when 9-11 um, happened and Australia entered the war on terror alongside the United States, the UK and many other countries. And um, it was interesting to see the uh, academic Orientalism that I was then reading, particularly the work of people like Bernard Lewis, the sorts of authors that Edward Said so effectively critiqued in Orientalism. Um, being disseminated and an industry forming after 9-11, um, Islamophobic ideas seemed to descend at, at that time particularly from the academy, through think tanks, through private organizations, um, and then they seemed to get a foothold amongst sort of the general population. I mean, Islamophobia, of course, existed before 2001, but I think the war on terrorism and the framework of the war on terror really provided more of a structure that made, I think, its operations visible, if you like. And I guess being a comic fan and a lover of comics and someone who loves to draw and write my own comics, um, it was really uh, disappointing and disheartening to see um, Frank Miller's work, particularly 300 after 9-11, being co-opted into the war against terrorism. And then, of course, Holy Terror, which came a few years later and was a blatant um, piece of sort of um, anti-Muslim propaganda. Um, I'll share my screen. 
I won't play all of my video. Oh, sorry. How do I share? Can I share my screen? At the bottom, there is a green. If you. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, let me just. And you have to open your document before you start the sharing. Oh, okay. Yep. Oh, that's strange. It's not letting me. Let me try again. Uh, desktop one. Oh, maybe because you're not wait, 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 you're not uh, co-host. I have to make you. Ah, uh, yeah, you need to make uh, me co-host. Uh, yeah. Yep. Yes. That's, um, Sorry about that. Oh, yeah. Not my fault. Also, I should have done it. Uh, how to do that? Uh, hmm. Okay. Yeah. I think I'm, that's going to make him co-host. Oh, yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah, if you yeah, if you yeah. click on desktop one, I think it should share your whole your whole screen. So I think that's an option. Oh, now it's asking for system preferences. Oh, dear. Oh. oh, okay. Maybe it's not working. In which case, I'll just keep going. Uh, doesn't seem to be happening. Never mind. Um, just real quick, if you wanted yeah. to give me a minute uh, cue that you'd like me to cue your video up, I can share it on my side if you'd like. Oh, sure. Okay. Do you want to share it from about seven minutes 47 seconds just to get rid of all the introductory introductory stuff what what particularly interests me is um i guess you know the field of culture as a discursive field in which racism is ah there we go yeah um is is sort of becomes if you like the common sense that people adopt um Oh, it might be a bit further along than that. How Western states should deal with their Muslim populations. Yeah, okay, we can go from here. Leaving aside I'll, the I'll let it play for a few minutes of Frank Miller's worldview. What is more interesting is the way his representations are disseminated in what George Hawley calls the Great Meme War, waged largely online passed. by members of the far right or so-called alt-right. The language of this movement is partly an outgrowth of online troll culture, in which political content can be masked by a tone of non-serious, shocking, or outrageous content, which might seem merely playful, transgressive, perhaps nihilistic. This has enabled the alt-right to present as a fun, politically incorrect movement who are bucking against what they see as a censorious, authoritarian streak in left-wing politics. This very effective form of right-wing identity politics has managed to popularize extremely regressive, even dangerous views about gender and race amongst young people. 300 has certainly entered the visual lexicon of that movement, alongside other popular images used by the alt-right, such as Pepe the Frog and the Punisher symbol. Memes created from the film 300 have been used by racist vanguardists, neo-Nazis, and self-described infidels, an explicitly anti-Islam community amongst Western military forces. For these groups, Sparta represents the undiluted masculine violence and militarism the West needs to defend itself from the external enemy of Islam and to cleanse itself from the internal enemy of left-wing multiculturalism. This is bound up in conspiracies about an impending white genocide or the great replacement of white people, an idea which motivated the Australian terrorists who massacred 51 worshippers in Christchurch, New Zealand in 2019. Spartan Cosby has been a notable feature of white supremacist or far right-wing rallies around the world. Here's one from a pro-Trump rally in the US. And here's some images from the anti-Muslim Reclaim Australia rallies in Sydney. Of the Spartan myth, Miller conceded, they were utter fascists, but he implies that some dose of fascism is necessary in the fight against mortal enemies. The Athenians were the ones who gave birth to democracy, but the Spartans made it all possible, he said. Alas, such ideas do not end well in a theatre of war. Oh, you could get, let it keep playing, I think this is the relevant example. The Australian military clearly has a cultural problem with anti-Muslim racism. Which has deadly consequences regarding its operations in Afghanistan. The 2020 Brereton Report revealed that up to 25 Australian Defence Force soldiers were involved in abuses and war crimes against civilians yeah, during uh, their deployments to Afghanistan yeah, over a 10-year period. Whistleblowers head. have Thanks. spoken out about the summary torture and execution of civilians, including cutting the throats of teenage boys and placing weapons or radios on their bodies to conceal those executions. The report cites an ethical drift amongst the Special Air Service Regiment by fostering 
fostering a warrior culture, quote unquote, that would contribute to the environment in which war crimes were committed. Whilst the report does not go into this culture in any detail, it clearly aligns with the anti-Muslim hatred spouted by so-called infidels amongst Western military forces. Some of the most disturbing parts of the report concern SAS servicemen who would view 300 before going into the field, particularly the actions of a soldier with the pseudonym Leonidas. That person was Corporal Ben Robert Smith, Australia's most decorated soldier. He is currently under investigation for allegedly kicking Ali Jan, an Afghan farmer off a small cliff near the village of Darwan, on September the 11th in 2012. This event clearly played out a macabre reenactment of a popular scene from the film 300, in which Leonidas kicks the Persian ambassador into a well. Ali Jan was a farmer who had no ties to any militant groups. He was handcuffed at the time and though he survived the fall, his face was badly damaged against rocks which knocked the teeth out of his mouth. Corporal Roberts aka Leonidas then agreed with others to execute Ali Jan, and another soldier is suspected of shooting him. To conclude, um, yep, it's not can... enough to simply deconstruct Frank Miller's 300 and holy terror in the way they've like. been interpreted. Beyond showing racist arguments are illogical, <clears throat> such interpretations and the actions that result from them need to be marginalised, reduced and devalued. After the far right-wing military and police appropriation of the Punisher symbol, for instance, there has been much discussion about how those responsible for the franchise should respond. Punisher co-creator Jerry Conway has gone on record to say that the Punisher symbol is better adopted by people of colour and those who protest the police killing of black people. As a vigilante who works outside the system to avenge injustice, Conway feels the Punisher would be on the side of Black Lives Matter protesters rather than with the state <coughs> or police. Here I make a direct plea to Frank Miller to go on record and renounce the conclusions readers have drawn from your work. Of course Miller is not responsible for every extremist interpretation of 300, but he has clearly laid the ground for those yep. views to flourish, and that's something he can always withdraw, take back, rewrite, and resile from. As a reader of yep. comics I believe we are all responsible for how they are received. Both creative people, the companies that own popular franchises, and the communities who follow them have a shared responsibility over the meanings imputed to the art, characters, and stories we love and admire. Racism is structurally embedded in our political systems, though it plays out on the ground as a popular mass movement co-opting a vast array of pop cultural forms and signs. To this end, racism needs to be combated both structurally at the level of government but also in our movies, songs and comics, in the cultural objects and stories which shape everyday life. As a creator, Frank Miller wields more power than most to bring about change. But even if he does nothing, the fans who read and love comics have a voice and have agency. As the big comic corporations embrace diversity both in their characters and amongst the people who create them, one feels the ground is already shifting. There's still a long way to go, but the Cold War framing of popular comic and cartoon characters to muster nationalist jingoism or hateful racist propaganda has been eclipsed, and long may it remain so. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, um, basically um, a few things about that. I guess the, the, the real inspiration to make this video was the recent revelations of Australian war crimes in Afghanistan, as pointed out in the video. The fact that um, this particular regiment um, who, who killed up to 40 people, um, civilians mostly, were, were getting pumped up on 300 um, and using that as sort of inspiration. Spartaphilia or laconophilia in our military and in the US military, of course, is nothing new. It's a strong feature of Cold War ideological politics within military um, forces. But in this case, I think 300, though the comic was made before 9-11, before 2001, the movie wasn't. Frank Miller, of course, was a producer on the movie and he himself framed this as the context for the war on terror and the battle between, you know, Western democracy and 
Middle Eastern barbarism or Islam as he saw it. So it certainly fits within the whole clash of civilizations paradigm. Holy terror is, is even worse. I mean, the binary view of the world that he, that he was pushing in those years is, is really um, pushed to a po the point of absurdity in holy terror. And it is pretty, pretty awful, pretty hateful work, which thankfully hasn't had much influence. Um, and I guess the final point I was making at the end of the video is that franchises, creators, and fans, I think, are jointly responsible for the meanings that, that these characters produce. It's heartening that DC didn't take on Holy Terror because Frank Miller originally pitched it as a Batman, as an installment in his, you know, work on Batman. I think once they read it, they realized that this would not gel as Batman, that it wasn't good enough, but also that it was very uh, prejudiced and Islamophobic. And so, um, yeah, I guess the point um, is that, yeah, we need to shift and shape these cultural tropes and these characters um, in an explicitly anti-racist direction. It's not enough for Marvel and DC also to sit on the fence and try to just sort of keep people happy. I think the time has come and we've reached a point at which um, these franchises, these creators, these characters need to be explicitly aligned against white supremacy, against Islamophobia and racism. So um, yeah, that's, that's what I was trying to bring together in the video. Um, I'm sorry if it's not very academic. It was my first go at a video and it, it comes across a little bit, um, you know, YouTube-y, but never mind. Um, hopefully, hopefully, um, uh, that's that's kind of yeah what I wanted to put forward. Thank you, Savda. I mean, I'm, I just an, an anecdote. I mean, uh, I start my class usually on a, a comic, especially superheroes, by uh, actually saying that I'm not going to teach uh, Miller uh, because. Uh -huh. of position so uh, <laughs> to make it uh, and most of my students are pretty aware of that um, of, of course, course they take my class because my class is about multiculturalism and superheroes but just to tell you that uh, the sure. fight is on <laughs> so we fighting yeah. that uh, it's not easy but because <laughs> we have yeah. a big, big amount of money in front of us but uh, <laughs> yeah it's also about yeah. registering my personal disappointment because I was a huge fan of Miller I loved Batman year one and his early works you know so yeah <laughs> <laughs> so then we can go to uh, the second presentation uh, by Safa Safa Al Shamari uh, is an English literature PhD student at the University of Granada in Spain correct Yes, correct. In Spain, yes, yeah. Uh, and uh, as a student in a research program, her scholarly concerns are focused on comic studies, uh, cultural studies, and social discourse built into the wide ranging cross cultural framework of post colonial literature. And the floor is yours, Safa. Thank you. Um, would I be able to share? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, I think I cannot do it, but yes, I see. Perfect. It's done, right? Yeah. Well, to start, I just to uh, I'd like to note on uh, Safdar. Thank you so much for the introduction. A little bit of the of my research is actually he has given the background from so, uh, clash of civilization to uh, post colonials uh, post colonialism is is really my background. I didn't mention it, but thank you so much. You started off uh, as kind of I guess we can consider this a little bit of a continuation to what you're saying, but from a different perspective. Thank you. Uh, so hi everybody. My name is Safal Shimeri. And my presentation is uh, on uh, a new Orientalist Awana study of Greg Thompson's Habibi. Sorry. Okay. So to give you a little bit of background about my graphic novel, Habibi is a graphic novel. It is a romantic fable. It is set in a contemporary land called Wanatolia. Now we have two main characters, uh, Dodula, a beautiful Arabian uh, female sex slave, and Zem, a castrated um, black slave child. Now what uh, Gary Thompson does is that he uses Richard Burton's translation of Arabian Nights. He uses Arabic calligraphy, images, and Arabian geometric design to create his work. Now this blend between the tradition of Arabian literary uh, fantasy and Western Orientalis Orientalist views uh, of what would be a contemporary West Asian uh, developing world uh, is the setting, if you can imagine that. Now I'll be discussing two themes, 
uh, space and identity. To start off with space, um, I refrain from using the term Middle East uh, because, um, and, and instead I'd be using uh, West Asia uh, and North Africa, or for short, uh, WANA. And this is due to the geographical uncertainty and Eurocentric existence of the word Middle East. Uh, some people, particularly in recent academia, uh, are altering to use other acronyms such as WANA. Uh, and this is, um, it's actually acknowledged by the United Nations because the term Middle East is a uh, British uh, imperial term. Uh, they had the Far East, which is India, and then the Middle East, which is the region of the uh, uh, Arab Peninsula, uh, is what they call the Middle East in comparison to the British Empire. Uh, now, why am I mentioning uh, politics and WANA politics? Because I am reflecting on WANA politics in academic world today. Now, my second theme is identity. Um, so although Thompson had not visited uh, West Asia nor spoke Arabic when writing Habibi, he represents the Muslim world, uh, Muslim religion and Wana history, landscape and, and culture from what could be considered an Orientalist thematic and aesthetic approach. Now, in the beginning, of my title, I mentioned New Orientalism. Some of you might not be familiar with this term, some of you might, but I'll start with Orientalism because it's a continuation. Um, now, Orientalism is if you Google search right now and write Orient, Orientalism, or the Orient, you would see snake charmers, uh, harems, veiled women, desert, um, something that you would see out of Lawrence of Arabia. And due to this is, uh, it, the, uh, the theory of Edward Said's Orientalism came, which is uh, placing Eastern cultures at a lower status. Uh, this cultural dominance of the West presented as logical, civilized, predominant, and legitimate, while uh, of course believing that the East cannot represent itself. It is backward, inferior, illogical, abnormal, and illegitimate. These stereotypical in images, it has uh, had endorsed 9-11 retaliated foreign policy, and this is why we have the wars uh, that happen ever since. Now, all these images are uh, that Greg Thompson uses are Orientalist cultural appropriation. So these are some images that you can see in the book. Uh, I apologize, some of the pictures that I'll be showing, uh, showing have nudity. Uh, the book has been banned in the United States for nudity, uh, but not, not other of the reasons I mentioned, the other reasons. So, but the first one here is uh, we have a little child uh, who is given off by her parents to this man. Uh, underage marriage is something against the law in the region. It is condemned and people don't do it. Uh, of course, there's a minority of people that do, uh, but it's, uh, it is a very, very uh, uh, slim uh, percentage. Now, the book is filled with uneducated women and underage marriage and objectification of women. We have nudity of, of women everywhere. And then on the contrary, we have women fully covered, veils head to toe of what you see in a harem uh, of an Ottoman empire. Now to start off, um, we start off with a little bit of a history and geography. Um, like I mentioned, geographically, um, if you open up an atlas, there, if you compare this the, with a with a um, uh, measurement uh, between, uh, there's no such thing as Middle East. It is to Asia. The region is West Asia, and and Middle East is imperialist. So it is important to keep in mind uh, historically that um, Arabian Nights are mostly uh, tales of entertainment. We are not reading history or anthropology. The background of the Nights is not historical context to West Asia today. So the graphic novel uh, is an, ad an adaptation of Arabian Nights. Um, it is the first comic book adaptation of Arabian Nights tales. It is evident that Thompson tries to compose his own Arabian Nights by merging a wide variety of West Asian fairy stories, Quranic texts, uh, and female heroine uh, who has been a depiction of an Odalsik. Now, 
Arabian Nights itself is actually a colonial creation. Uh, prominent Arab intellectuals highly reject folk traditions as part of a plot by colonial powers to corrupt the purity of the classical Arabic language and Arab civilization. This is why uh, you hardly find any sources of Arabian Nights uh, in Arabic. The colloquial text uh, was and is still rejected by scholars. It is considered lowbrow. Uh, so the manuscript itself that I'll be showing in the next text uh, is what Gallant found. And so the manuscript of the Arabian Nights were among the first texts produced by the new printing establishment founded in near and far east countries by Western European colonial powers of British of the British and the French. Sorry, I just want to show you the Gallen manuscript, then I'll go back to the previous one. So this is actually the Gallen manuscript that he found. There is actually no uh, Arabian Nights text, and uh, all the stories were oral stories that Gallen went to the Middle East, uh, quote by quote, uh, and he wrote. Um, so, and in fact, the Arabian Nights that is in Arabic, it is actually a translation of, of the French and the British. So Richard Burton's translation contributes to the mystification of the Arabian Nights and its central position in history of European Orientalism. The translation also represents an original approach to the text reflecting the concerns and tastes of the time. So the book was actually written uh, to the taste of the Victorian age. Um, it was actually at the time considered something equal to a pornography uh, because there's a lot of nudity, there's a lot of sex that was uh, condemned at the time for you to write something like that in, uh, in books. Uh, but uh, it was passed down as a history or a culture, so it was okay for people to read. Uh, now for the setting, when we, whenever we, we think of the Orient, we think um, deserts and, and, and camels, uh, but actually, in fact, uh, the center of, of, of the Arab world is actually in Damascus, Baghdad, and Cairo, which are big cities. Now, what Greg Thompson does, this is a little bit uh, going into gender studies, uh, the role of Arab women, uh, Daldala serves as a shaded metaphor of many roles of women in society and in personal relationships of how women are oppressed in society where they must face the rage and violence of males because they are vulnerable. He, sexual, he romanticizes and sexualizes rape. Now, the main character goes through three stages as a child raped by her um, uh, supposedly husband uh, at nine years old. Then uh, in her teenage years by caravan uh, men, uh, she uh, trades uh, her, her, uh, her rape for uh, food. And then as an adult for uh, the Sultan who repeatedly uh, rapes her. Uh, Daldala's rape is subjected to a uh, ruthless male savage fitting into the orientalist stereotype of savage men and oppressed women. So in conclusion, I, I counter this hegemony, uh, dismantling hegemonic power. Um, so this historical context of the Arabian Nights, I reject completely. Um, this is why I have, um, I'm doing this PhD uh, to uh, resist the insight of applying fictional stories as culture. And this is what Greg Thompson does, is that he passes down these uh, stories as um, the culture uh, of, the, of the region. These are just repeated Arabian Nights just for modern day. And these are some of the references I used. And thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you, Safa. Uh, even shorter than you still had two minutes. So <laughs> we have two more minutes for questions after. Thank you. Uh, and then the third presentation uh, by Paul Malan is an associate professor uh, of German at the University of Waterloo in Canada. Um, it's obvious Waterloo is in Canada for Canadians, but for sure for not not for non-Canadian. Uh, Waterloo is actually a city 20 uh, uh, miles away from the city where I was born in Belgium. So that's why it's necessary to say that this one is in Canada. That's what it is. <laughs> and uh, with publications on German language comics, film, drama, and literature. And the floor is yours, Paul, now. Uh, thank you very much, Chris. Uh, can I share my screen as well? Uh, so Keith is going to... You I should be able to. If you right, can, let's... just let me know and I'll make you co-host. Come on. Oh, there's a... Can you all see that? Yes. Okay, wake up. Okay, I just want to start by saying that the University of Waterloo Faculty of Arts acknowledges that we are living and working on the traditional territory of the Atawandran, also known as Neutral, Anishinaabe, 
and Haudenosaunee peoples. The University of Waterloo is situated on the Haldeman Tract, the land promised to the six nations that includes six miles on each side of the Grand River. And even though I'm not in my office right now, I'm pretty sure I'm still on uh, land that, that falls into that category. Uh, so I'm not going to uh, show uh, my whole presentation here because that's on the, the, the film that was uploaded, but I just want to, uh, whoop, this is the wrong, wrong presentation. Here we go. Um, uh, so I, I will talk about uh, representations of black characters or depiction, depictions of black characters in uh, three comic strips in the 1920s and 30s in Austria. Uh, starting with uh, Bumsta Nazi, uh, a character who is a living Christmas ornament, uh, whose name basically means fall down, go boom. Uh, Bumsta Nazi at one point falls into the hands of what he calls Hottentots, um, or cannibals, whom he then uh, Christianizes uh, because they can't eat him. He's made of wood. Um, and uh, uh, builds a church uh, with them, teaches them um, how to make Wiener schnitzel and uh, teaches them literacy, uh, which is difficult because he is himself only semi-literate uh, as essentially a small child, um, despite not being human. Um, nonetheless, uh, he is still sort of a, a figurative white man and therefore qualified to, to teach these people Christianity. So very much an infantilization um, of, uh, of the, the black characters in this very, very Christian uh, newspaper. In the Social Democrat left-wing uh, newspaper, uh, we have a, sh a short adventure strip called Clip and Clap. Uh, this is a left-wing newspaper that's very much in opposition to the uh, conservative Christian uh, uh, po political agenda. And uh, Clip and Clap end up, uh, uh, there's one brief uh, scene where a black sailor is shown as they cross the, uh, cross the Atlantic. Uh, but there's also this scene in Hollywood where they appear to be about to be attacked by, by black bandits, uh, but then it turns out that in fact they are actors. And what remains uh, difficult to tell because of the, uh, the racist uh, conventions of depicting black characters at this time is are these in fact black actors or are these white actors in black face? Um, the drawing style makes it actually literally impossible to tell. And uh, in some ways, uh, from the point of view of the storyteller here in the audience, uh, almost irrelevant. And then my third example is from the same paper, but it's from later on in the paper when it is no longer a social democratic paper because the um, Austrian Austro-fascist dictatorship has come in. And the character to be a cycle who was originally conceived as a parody of the right wing uh, becomes a slightly more heroic figure. He's still portrayed as an idiot. Uh, it's his talking dog, Struppi, who's the brains of the operation. But, but Psycho also ends up uh, in Africa at, at several points uh, because he couldn't produce a local satire anymore. Uh, the artist, uh, Kmochid, sends uh, his character uh, around the world. And at one point he is captured by cannibals. And we have little bits like, um, all of his characters speak Viennese dialect, no matter where they live or what their ethnicity is, with the result that they talk just like the, the hero. And they remark about how Europeans taste gamey, the cannibal characters do. At one point he's arrested uh, later on in another adventure by uh, local black policemen who are easily bribed, but who also clearly hold him and his party in contempt. And again, speaking in Viennese dialect, at one point he runs over a native who is, is not killed because it's kind of a slapstick comedy, but this is still, uh, it's interesting that in you know, many of these adventures, uh, his uh, colleague shoots uh, a native in the hand. Uh, we find that everything that happens to him at the hands of, of the, the local uh, black population is deserved because he has actually performed acts of violence or a member of his party has performed acts of violence on them. Uh, and he actually gets off pretty lightly. Uh, in the middle of this adventure is exactly when Nazi Germany annexes Austria and suddenly, um, although it was now a right-wing paper, it goes from being anti-Nazi to being a Nazi propaganda piece. Almost immediately, the party d uh, divests itself of its one black member, the nominal slave, Hudri Vudri, uh, who is also seen as you know, being certainly the 
smartest of the of the bunch, except for possibly the talking dog. So it's not exactly a completely non-racist depiction in that way. Uh, and then they're sent to Palestine, where the anti-Semitism uh, actually sort of outweighs um, the, anti, uh, the, the, the racism of the black decisions as a, as a kind of higher priority. Finally, about a year later, he goes to Australia and uh, one of the most racist aspects of this de de depiction is simply that the Australian natives are shown as being absolutely identical with the black natives of Africa. Um, as you can see, there's the African scene from a year before uh, and there we are in Australia. The huts are the same, the, the spears and, and shields are the same. And of course, because everyone speaks Viennese dialect, they also talk the same. And these, these Australian Aborigines are also uh, cannibals, which is a, a long-standing right-wing myth. Um, but by this time, because he's now, this is now a Nazi newspaper, uh, he is much more condescending, much more in control, um, and treated as a white god because of his rifle and things like that. So uh, this is a very clear distinction from the reasonably even-handed in the context of the times depiction of the black characters up till now. Um, so we have a very clearly paternalistic condescending uh, depiction in the Christian newspapers, in the early social democratic newspapers. We do have attempts to show black people as actually members of society, but obviously not Austrian society. Um, Austrians weren't aware that there were black people living among, among them. Uh, and then we move in the last phase to uh, this interesting kind of use of, of black society, first of all, as a kind of satire of Viennese society, but a very, a very much blunted satire given the censorship regime at the time before it moves into a much more racist mode uh, when the Nazis came in. And uh, I can stop that now. Uh, I just want to draw some some quick connections to some of the uh, to some of the things that that Safa and, and uh, Safdar are saying. Uh, although this is a sort of much uh, further back in history than either Craig Thompson or or Frank Miller, the attitudes that are shown in these strips are still present in Austrian society today. Uh, they actually have a layer of. Uh, Austria as Hitler's first victim is, is a sort of deep underpinning of, of Austrian society. The idea that because Austria was absorbed by Nazi Germany, it's somehow not culpable for, uh, for any of uh, Nazi Germany's racist acts. You, you, know, you can't be both a victim and a perpetrator and we're a victim, therefore we're off the hook as uh, underpins a great deal of establishment thinking in Vienna down to, in, in Austria down to the, the present day. Um, there's also the fact that the Austrian Empire, uh, long before this, at the, well, before World War I, was never a uh, colonial empire uh, in the sense that the British and French and even the German empires were. It had no holdings in Africa uh, or in Asia. Uh, and therefore, they're also off the hook, even though uh, the Austrian Empire was on the buyer's end of the slave trade uh, prior to 1811. Um, the corollary of that, of course, is that because Austria was not implicated in, in all of these events, uh, there are no black people, which is patently not true in Austria, and there's also no racism, um, which is also very clearly not true. Uh, and uh, just uh, doing some of the research for um, looking at the Austro, um, Afro-Austrians, as they're called, um, the pre-World War II population of Black Austrians was incredibly tiny, and very, very poorly documented. And we do know that about, about 60 Black people uh, were sent to the concentration camp Mauthausen under the Nazis uh, and, and died there. And that's actually something that has only just in the last year, year and a half, two years, uh, come to be an object of, of active research. Uh, it's, it's very much under-researched. So most uh, current Black Austrians um, are uh, post 1960s in terms of uh, uh, date of arrival, some much more recent, uh, and uh, many of them are residents but not citizens. Uh, uh, I was seeing some right wing blog entries tying into some of the things that Safter says. They're very clearly heavily invested in replacement theory. Uh, after the George Floyd murder last year, there were, of course, some Black Lives Matters. Uh, demonstrations in Vienna, as there were in many European cities. And um, 
some of the blog entries that you'll find on right-wing blogs are deeply uh, implicated in replacement theory. If you're in favor of Black Lives Matter, what that means is that within the next 10 years, the Blacks will be our overlords and we will be. And it's like, how, is, how would that even be possible? You know, if, that would be bad science fiction at, at, at its best. It's certainly not either sociologically or biologically um, tenable. But there's this fear um, and the, one of the things about looking at these old strips is that, yes, they're definitely racist. There's no, there's no defending them. Um, but it's the kind of racism that you create in the absence of the object of racism. They don't believe there are any black people to, it, among them. Um, and so there's a kind of, uh, absent other, as opposed to the very, very present Jewish other who is prioritized as both a present minority, uh, overly powerful in the views of, 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 of the right wing, um, and of course, uh, not a visible minority. Um, black people are a comfortable minority because you can spot them. You know a black person when you see one. Jews, you know, they could be anywhere. This this very kind of, uh, and that's why, particularly in the, in the, the later years of the, of the strip, um, uh, the the anti-Semitism is much more prevalent than the uh, and the, the Jews are the only ones who cannot speak proper Viennese dialect. Everyone else in the world can speak proper Viennese dialect, including uh, Indians uh, in in India. When he goes to India, that's where we get real Orientalism. Um, but the fact that everyone talks the way he does makes a tremendous difference. If you don't have the the native characters speaking pidgin of some kind, but speaking exactly the same language as your hero, um, even though the depiction is certainly still racist. Um, they seem as intelligent. And, and this is a hero who's from the, the get-go designed to be an idiot. So the bar is set low. Um, imagine Indiana Jones with the personality of Donald Duck. Um, so it, it's interesting to see these articulate um, black characters who are still uh, they're still antagonists, but they're often justified in their antagonism because our stupid hero is too violent and, and, and colonialized in his mind to not offend and, and injure them. Uh, and one interesting sort of micro dynamic within the strip is that the slave figure, Hudri Vudri, who is clearly portrayed as a Muslim, uh, he often interrupts, he, he often says, Allah in, in, in the middle of, of, a, of a sentence and something like that. Is, is clearly sort of distances himself from these other black natives who are pagans um, and is, is treated as much more of a, an equal member of the group. No one ever treats him like a slave, um, which you know, is not that gr great because they're too stupid to realize that he's their slave in a, in a sense. And he often says very cutting things about them. Um, but there's this, this very clear sense that he is not the same as as these other uh, black natives who wear the grass skirts and have the bones in their noses and things like that, all these um, horrific stereotypes. Um, so I mean, there's, there's a continuum uh, of attitudes there, uh, which is still present in Austrian society today. And there's still very much a, uh, an unwillingness to face the fact that now there are a small number, but a, but a significant number of black Austrians for whom German and in fact, Viennese dialect um, is their native language, um, as well as, of course, I mean, this is this is a corollary to, but also a ancillary to the question of, of uh, Islam versus the West. Of course, many of these Black Austrians are are not Muslims necessarily. Uh, so, Mind if I to ask a question? Yeah, by all means. Yeah, I mean, let's, yeah, let's start no, the discussion even because I have nothing left to say. <laughs> okay, sure. <laughs> the floor is no, open to questions. Yeah, great. I, I was going to ask about um, uh, anti-Semitic imagery and whether it was present at the same time, because it seems as though cartooning of that period, certainly, it, it's almost an informal representation of racial types, you mm -hmm. know, the physiognomic, the exaggeration yeah. of, you know, certain characteristics and so yeah. on. So on one hand, you know, racism had its scientific discourse and there were like books of physiognomy and measuring skulls and all of that stuff but cartooning was how these yeah. ideas were popularized amongst the masses so i guess my question was do you know 
um, if there's anything about that period in, in Austria that makes those images unique, or is this shared part of the shared visual tropes that you find right across Europe and in Germany and neighboring countries at the time? Or is, or is this something distinct about this, this period, do you the, think? Visually, there's nothing distinctive about these representations. Okay. They are entirely in line with, with the, the representations you'll find in other European artists and in Africa. And, you know, Karl Barks in, in the US drawing Donald Duck is using yeah. many of this, even, even when he's in some ways arguably problematizing some of these racist tropes. Visually, this is this this is the the, the pseudo blackface with the big white lips, yeah. Um, yeah. which uh, and you know you can you can defend it in a technical way, saying these guys are drawing these tiny little strips, and you know so it's it's a it's a very simplified, easy to read iconography that says black person, mm -hmm. uh, and if you just you know, drew an ordinary person and colored them darkly, the ink is going to run. You're not going to be able to see anything, so you can say oh yeah you know but you know we could still try harder to do that or maybe just don't color them dark um you know anyway uh so visually there's nothing new here it's exactly mm. what you would expect mm. and certainly the depiction in the christian newspaper is again exactly what you'd find in thousands of cartoons all over the western world um or north america south america europe um the characterization in terms of the of, of making everyone speak the same way that is unusual um mm -hmm. and you know again it, it doesn't mean that the artist wasn't wasn't racist but for him the humor comes from the fact that these people are just like talk just like middle class viennese people mm -hmm. whether they're indian maharajas or chinese mandarins or um cannibal chiefs in, in Africa, they all talk like your butcher down on the corner um, and, and like the hero. And that's, that's interesting. Um, again, it doesn't make it not racist, but it makes it differently racist and it kind of, it kind of uh, complicates things. Um, I did just want to, to point out that there's, a, there's been a, bit, a lot about the, the yellow star lately, thanks to our good friend Marjorie Taylor Greene. Uh, comparing vaccinations, things to the yellow star that the Jews were, were made to wear. And of course, uh, the, the contrast between anti-Semitism and anti-Black or, or um, anti-Brown uh, anti uh, racism is, of course, that making the Jews wear the yellow stars in 1941 was an attempt to construct them as a visible minority, to change them from an invisible minority to a visible minority. And we have anecdotal evidence that many um, Germans and Austrians' reaction on the streets was to go, I'd never realized there were so many Jews. The Nazis are right, they are a threat. Um, so, you know, that worked, you know, it suddenly made them as visible as black people are. Um, and finally, one last thing, I don't want to uh, take up too much more and more room, dude, because you did talk about anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism, certainly in Austrian uh, media at the time, is something that we just find pervasive, even in the left wing, even among Jewish creators and, and publishers and editors. Uh, because for the left wing, many of the anti-Semitic stereotypes uh, were also anti-capitalist stereotypes. And so many of the left wing um, caricatures of plutocrats drawn by Jewish artists for Jewish editors and publishers um, also have very strong anti-Semitic. Um, and of course, many, 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 so many of the leading social Democrats were themselves of Jewish background, but had distanced themselves from from the Jewish religion. They didn't feel like they were Jews. Um, the Nazis, of course, said, you can't stop being a Jew. So that was the huge difference mm -hmm. there. So I'll stop there because it's somebody else's turn to talk. But thanks, thanks for your question. Thank you, Paul. Uh, yes, Safa, you have a question? Yes, to confirm, Paul, did you say that uh, in present day that the, there is this Austrian movement towards Black Lives Matter that, um, that Blacks were going to take over? Is that like present now? I mean, there were uh, anti-racist uh, demonstrations last year after the, the George Floyd murder, uh, very prominent ones. I mean, there, there's, there, there's a, a significant left wing, particularly in Vienna, uh, who, who are deeply invested in anti-racism. Um, you know, some of it is, is well-meaning, but, but also not necessarily helpful to actual racialized people, but, but they, they are trying. Um, 
but there are, there is right wing reaction to this, which is clearly uh, totally invested in replacement theory. The idea that if you even support the idea that black people are people, then they're going to be running the show in five years and they'll treat us the way we have always treated them, which always seems to be the, the, the core of these sort of re these uh, replacement theories is, oh my God, what if they treat us the way we treated them? Yeah, Thank you Sa very much. Sa Safa, yeah, I mean, the replacement theory is all over the extreme right, uh, yeah. all over the white world, I mean, the Western world. I mean, yeah. uh, it, it's, it, it is um, a theory that is uh, constantly repeated by the extreme right uh, and that is seeping little by little uh, in, into the, the middle class or uh, not necessarily the, the extreme right. So it's, that's why it's, uh, it's tricky. I mean, I wouldn't say it's shared by most people, but it's the prime of the, the seeping in, you know, like the, the fact that it's little by little uh, becoming something that is main, mainstream discourse. I mean, you can see that very clearly in the US but also in other countries uh, is, is uh, yeah, it's pretty scary, <laughs> that's for sure. Yeah, and, and deep, deeply intertwined between black racism and anti-black racism and Islamophobia, which are, are not the same thing, but often overlap. I very much suspect that at least prior to 2015, most of the black people in Austria were not, in fact, Muslim, um, although that's, that's probably changed since 2015 and, and the refugee wave. Keith, you have a question? Yeah, I, I had a question for Safa. Um, I was just wondering, I haven't read uh, Habibi. I've read some of Craig Thompson's other work like Blankets and I kind of have a mixed opinion of him. I was just kind of wondering, um, I, I really liked how you were able to kind of trace, you know, the Orientalist imagery that he was drawing back to kind of like the historical root texts. I was wondering, not having read it myself, is, is the impression that Thompson, is this just a, a result of a lack of research on his part and a kind of laziness of depending on like common materials that are available to Western audiences? Or is there a sense to which he has really kind of internalized this impression of the culture? And it's, you know, it's not just that, oh, he should have dug deeper, but it's no, he's like fully invested in this, in this impression. Thank you for your question. Um, sadly, uh, the answer to that is that he did seven years of research. Um, and in many of his interviews, he mentioned that he had many friends that he had given, um, specifically Muslim friends, that he had never had Muslim friends before, but he made friends for specifically for his research. And he had given them his, um, for example, whatever manuscript he did um, to for them to take a look at if it, if it was offensive or whatever. Uh, but it was, it was a part of, um, he said that I was going to get criticism this is controversial, but I'm still, I'm still going to write it. Wow, thank you. That, that is useful context. <laughs> You're welcome. That so was my impression. Yeah, I'm sorry, just to pitch in, because no, 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 I, I read Habib, Habibi as well. And I think my impression of it was it, it is deeply researched. And there are some beautiful pages about Sufism, about the importance of the Quran and calligraphy. There are pages which you know i wish sort of wish someone else had had done because the book is marred um and i think deeply undermined by the things that you were talking about Safa, particularly the idealization of women's bodies the weird fetishization of the girl the very recurrent rape rape theme of rape as well and the sort of link to oriental you know, stereotype of Oriental men as lascivious, you know, sexually kind of unhinged and so on. So, I mean, those, some of those stereotypes were really unforgivable and really ruined the book completely for me. It, it became this big, you know, just potpourri of, of, of stereotypes and misconceptions, unfortunately. Uh, but he tried. He certainly tried. There's, there's some research in there. Yeah. That was seven years. I mean, exactly. I picked it up the first time and I'm like, oh my God, Arabic calligraphy. I mean, I can read a little bit of Arabic. My background is Arabic, but I'm like, oh my God, this could be, could have been a really good book to kind of explain the culture with the Arabic calligraphy, the Quran or whatever. He tried to do all three Abrahamic uh, re uh, religions. So there's like Christianity, Bible, uh, Christianity, Judaism, and the Quran all in one. Um, so he even did the story of 
um, I, I, I had to read the, both, like the Christianity and uh, the Islamic version of um, Ishmael, and, uh, yeah. and he left it off, and he's like, so you don't know the ending, which one he meant, he just, he did it where there's, oh, the, look, there's similarities between the religions, it really brought the religions together, but I'm just like, really, like, you could have done a better job. <laughs> Mm. Actually, my problem with Habibi is the same problem I have with Blankets too, albeit it's a very different story about, you know, young romance. Blankets also, I thought, was was weirdly fetishizing of, of the woman, you know, this kind of um, idealization, if you like, this strange heterosexual male fantasy that that carries through both books. I think that would be my main criticism of his work. The ink work is beautiful. The the actual formal construction of his comics, the uh, his technique is is amazing. But yeah, that that element is what just is what annoys me about it. it annoys really, isn't the right word, but troubles me. That yeah. was very much my experience with blankets as well. And okay, I was at an age where I was just kind of like, oh, I recognize some problematic aspects of my teenage perception of women in this <laughs> yeah. work that's being celebrated. Uh, yeah. I think that's a good example of how research itself is not simply a good in and of itself and mm. a neutral thing. I mean, if, if the sources you're using for your research are tainted by imperialism and colonialism and Orientalism, then you're going to have a very difficult time working outside of, of that box. Definitely. And you, we have centuries worth of exactly that kind of research, thanks to the British Empire and the French Empire. Yeah, that's exactly what Said showed. It's that the yeah. research itself was biased. Safa, I have a question to follow up. I mean, uh, to something you said. I mean, which is a little bit on the opposite side. I mean, uh, you, you talked about the rejection of Arabian uh, nights by uh, Arab intellectuals. I, I don't have the same um feeling about i mean my friends uh arab friends for example uh, uh intellectuals would would recognize it uh even if you, as you said arab and arabian nights are not uh scholarly books or are not uh, scholarly sources i mean it's pop culture of that time right i mean uh, and so it's usable i mean there are things that are interesting and challenging in it uh and and so uh, could you elaborate a little bit on your sentence when you're saying that most, uh, or apparently, uh, that's what I understood, uh, uh, Arab intellectuals would reject uh, the Arabian Nights? Uh, yes, uh, because I did my research into asking Arabic uh, uh, Arab language professors about the, like if I can have any text uh, to uh, to read about it, and they said that it's not something that's researched as as um, because. Arabian Nights was popularized after colonization. So it was actually a book. There's no, like I said, there's, um, it is, the manuscript itself is written in colloquial, which is um, not accepted in literature. It's, you, how do I say this? It has to be pure, pure Arabic language. And it was random colloquial, how someone like would speak in hip hop and consider this um, um, like Shakespeare or something. I mean, I'm trying to make two uh, images side by side here. Um, so yes, it is still rejected to this day when I ask Arabic professors to, um, to kind of help me out with the sources of, uh, of Arabian nights. There are none, there aren't any. But Safa, I mean, uh, when you're talking about purity, I mean, uh, this is a big issue <laughs> on the other side. I mean, uh, where, I mean, uh, I mean, does how, why would it have to be pure? I mean, uh, uh, I, I don't understand. I mean, it's like you're comparing uh, rap music and Shakespeare. For me, both are useful. I mean, both are interesting, challenging in their own ways. And so I wouldn't have, I mean, one more time, it, uh, it's personal, but uh, I wouldn't have that issue with rap music and Shakespeare. For me, they, I use both and, and they both you know, bringing their own challenge in a negative and positive way. And so for me, the Arabian Nights, I'm, I don't speak Arabic, so of course I'm, I'm ignorant in that case, but from the experience that I have from my friends, they wouldn't reject the Arabian Nights because it's not pure. I mean, uh, you could criticize it or very obviously that, but you can criticize anything and that's the point of being a, a critical thinker. But uh, to the point of rejecting it is, there's a difference here. So I'm not sure I understand what's going on here. 
Um, <laughs> grammatically, I mean, I guess, if you like to put it in this way, because there are many grammatical mistakes. It is written in everyday language, which in literary, um, this is what I've gotten the answer, but if you can get me another answer, I'd, I'd love that. <laughs> because no, yeah, Safa, I, I understand linguistically, but one more time, you could apply the same criticism about linguistics where, I mean, there's no one pure language. There are different languages, different levels of language. And so uh, rap music is, is a different language. I mean, uh, and, and so obviously it's not a pure language from the Shakespearean point of view, but Shakespeare died a long time ago. <laughs> and so I wouldn't, you know, apply the, the criteria, linguistic criteria that, uh, of Shakespeare to rap music or to anything nowadays. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, it's going to be, yeah, it is time actually, and we're going to have to finish here. But yeah, I was a little bit um, surprised, but, but uh, yeah. No Chris, Chris, how does the Académie Française feel about Joal? But I don't care about the Académie Française. <laughs> yeah. Académie Française is not a reference. No. No, but, uh, is, is the equivalent of extreme yeah. right in in politics. Yeah, I mean, it's extremely conservative. So I've it is, it is. But I, but it was once mainstream. Uh, yeah, a long time ago. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. and still, for some people, it's still. Uh, so I, I I'm not defending yeah. Académie Française. No, no, I, I know. I the know. opposite, I, completely the opposite. So uh, yeah. yeah, because I'm French speaking, I don't think that I, there is a, a different standards for French things and English and Arabic. I mean, there's the same critical criterion which is uh, there's no purity and you have to understand all languages uh, and all levels of languages. And uh, so the issue of purity is, is very tricky, but yeah. we have I, to, unfortunately, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, 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 I do think it's, it's partly a fact that, that uh, classical Arabic is both a scriptural language and a still living language, which is not a problem we have with Hebrew, uh, with biblical Hebrew uh, or Greek or Latin. Uh, there's a distance between there, but, but there's this, this uh, I think, a very strong sense that there's a, a perfect Arabic that is, that is a godly language uh, and, and is given a very strong priority over colloquial forms. Yeah, I mean, but this is, uh, this is where the problem is. I mean, where, I mean uh, if you have a language that is pure, uh, that, that's the beginning of the problem, <laughs> of the problem of not being critical. Yeah, but yeah. that's another issue um, yeah. that we don't have to, time to discuss here, sorry about that. Because we do have another, um, I mean, a panel after yeah. 10 30. Uh, so we have, uh, we need to, to finish here. So thank, thank you me. very, very much, uh, Safa, Savdar, and Paul. And, Thanks so much. Um, thank you, thank you all. And hopefully we'll have more opportunities to elaborate on that. <laughs> thank you very much. Bye bye. I really Thanks enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good to meet you. Have a good to meet you.